This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. If you sign up for CuriosityStream at the link in the description, you'll also get access to Nebula, a streaming service by and for independent creators like me. Check out Nebula now and you can get access to my Nebula original Working Titles episode, where I analyze the legendary anime series Neon Genesis Evangelion. I've seen a lot of people talking about how things are strange or unusual right now. It almost feels like water cooler talk, and I guess in some ways that's what it is. Everyone is standing around, waiting for things to go back to normal. What weird times we live in, huh? Shut the fuck up, Walter. The world is ending. And jokes aside, I really do feel like everything that's happening right now is presenting us with a unique opportunity to stop and think about what really matters. Realize what we take for granted, and decide what we should leave behind. Because I don't think things are going to go back to normal. There's going to be a new normal, and it's not going to look like what we have now. In the words of the 17th century thinker Blaise Pascal, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And he was right. Our services, our entertainment, shopping, fashion, in many ways are sustained by our inability to keep to ourselves. We need constant distraction and entertainment to stay happy. So now, as we are literally being forced to sit quietly in our rooms for the foreseeable future, we are in a much more basic state of being. And most people aren't taking this sudden transition very well, myself included. I bought a bass to learn to play while I'm stuck at home. I took up producing music and I've been exercising a lot. But I also feel absolutely insane from a lack of social contact and I've been finding it really hard to focus. So instead of a regular video about my regular topics, I decided to make a list of albums that complement our sudden return to fundamentals, in the hopes that it would calm me down a little bit. And I hope it helps you too. Because these aren't just strange times, they're a rare chance to slow down and figure out what's really important to us. And before we get started, you can also look in the description for a link to my Quarantunes playlist to listen to the music listed in this video. My first pick for albums for the end of the world is a pretty obvious choice. Father John Misty's Pure Comedy is the ultimate existentialist album in which he attacks and criticizes almost every aspect of the modern world, from romance and family to technology and the environment. It's a long album with minimal instrumentation, but Misty's writing is so engaging that I find it easy to listen to pure comedy from start to finish, even three years after it came out. And when Pure Comedy came out in 2017, Misty released it alongside an 1800-word essay analyzing the album's symbolism and themes. He talked about his thoughts on human nature and the various coping mechanisms we use to deal with our tendency toward corruption and egotism. I've found it especially helpful during the last few weeks, and I know I'll be listening to it for a long time to come. My next pick for albums for the end of the world is Good Kid Mad City. It's kind of a strange choice, but it's honestly been helping me feel a lot better while stuck inside. It tells a fascinating story about growing up, and it really reminds me of my own life while I was in high school. I try not to live in the past, but with all of this extra time free of distractions, I've been looking back at my life and trying to figure out how to avoid my mistakes while also moving forward. The record's 10th track, Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst, has especially reminded me of my own experience as a teenager and the years where my future was uncertain. It reminds me of how I kept striving anyway because I blindly hoped for better days ahead. Looking back, it feels obvious that I would make it out of those hard times, but back then the future was anything but clear. It feels the same today as I sit alone in my room, day after day, wondering when I'll be able to go out and live a normal life again. Good Kid Mad City reminds me that hindsight is 2020 and that in the future, I'll have more wisdom and patience than I do now. What I can't put into words today will be a beautiful poem tomorrow. I think it's pretty obvious to put a Radiohead album on this list, but maybe The Benz is a somewhat strange pick. I chose The Benz because I think it's a more youthful, immature record than the two albums that came after it, Radiohead's most popular records, OK Computer and Kid A. While it may not be a classic like those albums, I found it much more comforting to listen to during a quarantine where the future is uncertain. The Benz was only Radiohead's second album, and they felt a huge amount of pressure for it to succeed after their debut did so well. 
they were pretty stressed out while writing it, and you can really hear that in the album's songwriting and Tom York's vocals. But they weren't yet disillusioned with the world as on Kid A or OK Computer, so I found it quite comforting to listen to their vaguely edgy, nervous rock and roll ramblings while I'm stuck inside with too much energy and no way to use it. I know it's become a huge meme, but I have been spending a lot of time thinking about past relationships and how those have changed over time. And in my opinion, Joni Mitchell's Blue is the perfect album for reflecting on and thinking about past relationships. Her songwriting is so good, so relatable and timeless, that I found it therapeutic to just sit back and listen to Blue while I'm stuck at home and can't go out. It's a beautiful, often joyful, and often melancholy look into the heart of one woman who somehow managed to speak for everyone when she sat down to write her album about her own experience with love. King Crimson's 1969 debut is one of my favorite records of all time. It's also the oldest record on this list, yet somehow one of the more relevant as well. The record is a beautiful progressive rock odyssey that discusses themes such as political turmoil, exploitation by the government, war, and religion. From literal apocalyptic songs like Epitaph, which discusses nuclear destruction, all the way to the record's title track, an epic look back in time at an imaginary medieval court, In the Court of the Crimson King is a beautiful album with heavy subject matter and hard-hitting instrumentation. Despite being 51 years old, its social commentary is as relevant today as it ever was. And the fact that in my lifetime I'll see it turn 100 is amazing. I have a feeling we'll still be listening to it then, too. I was originally going to make this list just five videos long, but I had to include one last album. The single most relaxing record for me during all of this stress has been the Minecraft soundtrack. I know it's not yoga or tea and candles or something that's actually supposed to be healthy, but something about the Minecraft soundtrack just makes me feel calm. It reminds me of better times in the past and it gives me hope that there will be better days in the future. I know a lot of people feel the same and that makes me feel less alone too. At the same time, it helps me ground myself with its peaceful instrumentals that allow me to assign any meaning to their sound. Without lyrics, I'm fully able to relax. The burden of interpretation is removed, and I can simply exist in the moment, not worrying about the past or the future. Thank you for tuning into my video about music for the end of the world. This is an unusual video for me, but I wanted to do something fun and less serious than normal because I've been having a hard time focusing for the last couple of weeks. I hope everyone is staying strong at home, and I'll be trying to make a lot of videos soon to keep everyone entertained. But if you need entertainment now, I recommend capturing Woodstock, a documentary about the Woodstock Festival, which occurred during another period of extreme unrest in the world. You see, the popularity of music festivals is a fairly recent development for Americans. In 1952, the Newport Jazz Festival introduced the idea of music festivals to Americans. And just 17 years later, the popularity of the Woodstock Festival in New York ensured that American festivals weren't going away anytime soon. In fact, it spawned a massive commercial industry that continues to this day. And you can learn more about Woodstock on CuriosityStream. Capturing Woodstock is a fascinating documentary that shows you what it was like at the very beginning of festivals as we know them today. And CuriosityStream is the best place to find documentary content online, with thousands of documentaries on a whole host of topics. And not only that, but if you sign up to CuriosityStream at the link in the description, you'll also get access to Nebula, where you can watch original content by creators like myself, Polyphonic, Real Engineering, and Polymatter. I even produced my own episode for Nebula's original working title series on the legendary anime Neon Genesis Evangelion. Nebula is a great way to find out more about the world around you, and it's also a great way to support creators who are looking for freedom from the constraints of YouTube. So get a year's worth of CuriosityStream and Nebula for $20, or a 30-day free trial at the link in the description.